two weeks ago. Uh, Nick stood up here and, and gave us his testimony. And what a powerful, powerful testimony that was. I mean, just amazing. And uh, I believe that, uh, that everyone needs a testimony. And some of you, you've got a testimony, but you've never shared it. Uh, and uh, you need to be sharing your testimony, what God's done for you. It's very easy. You don't have to have the Bible memorized, but Paul twice in the book of Acts, two different times, Paul shared his testimony, and it was a very basic three-point outline that he did both times. Number one, he shared what his life was like before Christ. Number two, he shared how he met Christ on the Damascus Road. And number three, what his life had been, what his life had been like after he accepted Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. Uh, so a very simple uh, way to share your testimony, and God will use your testimony. Now, to be quite honest and straight and, and frank today, that there's some of you here and you really don't have a testimony uh, about uh, trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I just want you to know that's not a crime, because at one time I was lost too, and I'd never been saved, and I didn't have a testimony uh, until Jesus saved my soul one day when I surrendered to him. Uh, and so uh, it's not too late to give your life to Christ. Uh, but uh, so uh, the few days after Nick had shared his testimony, uh, Daniel texted me and told me that if I saw fit, uh, that he'd be uh, honored to, uh, to share his testimony. I didn't ask him. Uh, the Spirit just led him to do that. And, uh, and I believe uh, that God is in this. And we are, uh, we are, um, we are just in awe that, uh, you know, that some of our men would want to stand and share their testimony as God had burdened their heart to do so. So, Daniel, you make your way up here. And you be praying for Daniel as he comes. Uh, what, a, what an amazing time to hear the testimony. An exciting time of our brothers uh, in Christ. Is this loud enough? This thing right here gets substantially smaller the closer you get up here. I, I, it's not tested or proven, but I think that perhaps the confidence and experience of a pastor probably has something to do with the size of the podium right here because this one's see-through and this one's very small. I probably would need something about the width of that table right there and a little bit taller. But um, first of all, if I want to pray real quick before we get started, if you don't mind. But dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this opportunity to come to you. Lord, I just pray that you use us this morning. I uh, just thank you for each and every person that has traveled here today. Uh, calm my nerves. I'm a little nervous right now, and I just pray that if there is somebody out there, Lord, that needs a touch from this, I pray that they hear it, Lord. So in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, I want to address the visitors really quick because this is my first time doing this. I don't do this very often, and uh, well, obviously, if I don't, this is my first time. I've never done it very often, but <laughs> the point is, is that it's going to be pretty rough, and with that said, just strap in and put on your helmet. It'll be over with very quickly. Um, but with that, you know, just a little anecdotal story. Most of you won't understand it, but uh, I judged collegiate livestock whenever I was in college, and there was a portion of the contest where you gave oral reasons, and what we would always do is, is we'd try to get in behind somebody that we didn't think was quite as good as us, and that would make us sound even better whenever we would jump in there and give our reasons. So David's going to look about 25 times better here in about 10 minutes <laughs> at my expense, and that's, that's just all right with me. But with that, you know... Um, I don't want any credit for this because I think that if there's anybody on this side of eternity that deserves credit for this, it's Nick. Because on the Monday morning of that pastor's prayer breakfast, he came in with a prayer burden. And, you know, he felt led to give his testimony. And I thought, boy, that's, that's powerful stuff. And I would say if you've never taken the opportunity to uh, go to that pastor's prayer breakfast in the morning, you really need to. It doesn't take a lot of time, and it's very, very powerful, and we get a lot of work done, a lot of prayer. But with that said, um, I saw Nick get up here and how God used him. And I thought, man, that is some big, big stuff there. You know, there's no doubt about it. And with that, I thought, you know, if it takes us getting just a little bit uncomfortable, you know, for God to have his will done, then shame on all of us for not taking the opportunity. So I thought that, well, here we are. You know, so, um, you know, most of y'all have known me your whole life. I've went to church here my entire life. You know my family. You know my family's family. But anyways, um, so I got saved uh, when I had a, well, I quote unquote got saved at a very, very young age. I was in that old sanctuary over there. It was during Bible school. And uh, it was one of the last nights of Bible school. Preacher came in there and he said, uh, All right, we know we're going to talk about that talk. You know, it's time to give your life to Christ if you feel led. Now, first off, before I say that, I believe that God can save anybody at any age, at any time, anywhere, 
however he wants to. But at that time, it was not right for me. Now, the, uh, he got in there and he started talking. And, you know, you know me, probably seven years old. I got one eye open looking around, seeing who else is going to jump first. So, you know, there's a few of them that went, so, so I did too. So, that was, and so you know, I, I said that prayer, you know, um, but I didn't experience an inward change, guys. You know, it was kind of one of those things where I went through the motions. And, you know, obviously the family's happy because, woohoo, he got saved. You know, like my mom, I'm sure she's like, all right, that box is checked. Let's move on. So, um, but that wasn't it, guys. I lived most of my, um, all, probably 15 years of my life, risking missing heaven by the distance between my head and my heart. And that's how you guys, you know, have heard him preach a lot of times about. And that, and that, and that was a, you know, that's not a good thing, guys. You know, and it was all self-inflicted. It was on me. I did that, not anybody else. Um, so, you know, I lived out middle school and high school, and it was, it was good. You know, we went through some stuff, but, it, you know, everybody does. And we're all blessed, you know, we're blessed because of it. But with that said, you know, I never considered myself a bad person. You know, I, I tried to do the right things, tried to be a good person, hang out with a good crowd, and not really get in a lot of trouble. But, you know, but I'm still unsaved. You know, that's one of those things to where you can try to be as good as you want to be, but at the end of the day, you're either saved or you're not saved. And there is no middle ground there. And so I graduated high school and um, went to college. Uh, had a good time in college. Um, I lived how I wanted to live. I did a lot of things that a lot of college people would do. You can use your imagination there. I actually have some, one of my very best friends. He says he's listening right now, or he did say he was going to, that if you could get him to tell some stories on me, you would think, how could he ever be standing up here sharing the good news of God? And I can tell you that that is just a testimony that the fact that he can save anybody, any place, any time, in any condition. So th here, here's, here's where I'm going with all this. I went to college, you know, had fun. I would come back during the, uh, I'd come back during the breaks and, you know, come and listen to, you know, come to church as just a routine, right? You know, you grow up in the South, the routine of going to church every single Sunday. Um, the, you know, and then there would be that small little voice coming in your head like, are you sure you got that right? You did, did you get that right the first time? And, uh, and, and that's called conviction. And if nobody knows anything about conviction, the one word that I can probably sum it up as is very, very uncomfortable. Right. It's, a, it's a terrible, right. it is an awful time in your life, guys. Yeah. It, it'll make you mad. It'll make you moody. Right. It'll make you, and I, if you're anything like me, you'll sit there and you'll question God and you'll be like, man, why are you doing this to me? Like, I don't deserve this. I feel like I'm, I try to be a pretty good guy. But, you know, obviously we always fail. But, you know, but I was in that perfect little storm there to where I could go back to college, escape from it, get it out of my mind again, and, and just live life the way I wanted to live. So that rocks on, you know, for a few visits. You know how college is. You come home on different holidays and such. You're, you know, there no more than two weeks at the time. So I get there, and, and we get home on a summer break. And I think if I'm, those of you that know me, you know that I'm very, very bad with dates and times, and if you don't believe me, I'm one of the last ones that runs through that door every Sunday usually. But um, with that said, though, I got home on a summer break, and, you know, obviously summer's about two months, and you're like, well, you're here now, and you're not going to escape from it. So then the conviction starts again, and one of the things that I want to make abundantly clear about conviction is, is that it may be a little bit different in some people's mind, or in some people's hearts and souls and minds, but it has the same result. And, you know, you're going to hear me say a lot of the same things that Nick said during his testimony. And the point that we're trying to drive home here is that it may be different. The scenario may be different, but you're going to experience the same thing, and it's not going to be very fun. So you would get, I mean, I would get here in church, and I'd be exactly like Nick. I wanted to hit that fast-forward button from the time we sat down, from the time we left. And I wanted to especially skip that invitation part, because that's when things got dicey. That's when you start fighting yourself, wondering if you can hold it back or not. So... We, we would get through there, and I, I would I'd just I'd clench my fist. You know, you'd try to, I mean, there's going to be, I mean, there's, when you're under conviction, there's a lot of tears. That's okay. You know, man, woman, child, indifferent, whatever. But the thing about it is, is, is you just want to get through. You want to get out of here. And, be, and as bad as it hates to say it, you want to get as far away from here as you can. Because you know when you're here, you're under the conviction of God, and you, you're, you just really can't get away from it. So with that said, uh, there was one morning. And, and, and they always say when you know, you know, I don't really like that saying, but it is true here. Um, it's like the light switch goes off. It's very, very obvious, and it's very, very, um, you know, it just, it just happens at, a, at, a, at an instance, and it's not planned. Um, they got in here one day. They started singing. I thought, oh, my, my fist clenched. I thought, I don't know if I can run from this anymore today. And 
David got up here and he started preaching hell's hot and heaven's sweet. And I thought, oh, man, I don't know if I can do anything with this. You know, and, and a lot of people, you know, talk about, oh, I got saved the next time, next day, next year. And the only thing that I can really remember about it specifically is I can remember some of the last things that, um, that David said before they gave the invitation. And before we get to that point, I want to be clear that, um, you know, I, I mean, all, you know, I hope everybody's in here is saved. But that's probably, I mean, if, just being honest, it's probably not the case. But, you know, David didn't save me. This church didn't save me. But there's no doubt that God equipped the singers with the songs that morning, David with the word to loosen my heart up in order for me to come to Christ. And, and, I, and that's, you know, that, that's not planned. That's only planned by God. That's not planned by us. And, you know, he gave, he gave, that, he gave that, that invitation. And the last thing that he said was, he said, all you got to do is you got to stick your foot out in that aisle right there. And it's almost like somebody grabs you and pulls you up. And then before you know it, you're already up here on your knees, you know, weeping. And that's exactly what happened for me. The only thing I can remember is when I stepped out and when I sat back down. And, I mean, that whole day, guys, during that service, it was like an elephant was sitting on my chest. Like, it, the further we kept getting closer to that invitation, I was like, I'm going to have a heart attack. Like, I could not breathe. Like, it, it was getting that bad. And, and I, I, I wanted to get up and leave. Like, that's how, that's how bad it had gotten, but I could not move. I knew that that was the point to where we could not hold it off any, any longer. And so got up here, you know, got saved. It was great. Everybody's, you know, everybody's happy. And, you know, and I want to say that, that it's all going to be great after that. But anybody that stood up here and says it's not, that's just not the truth. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're still gonna fail. You know, you're still gonna, you're still gonna do the wrong things. Um, I'm not perfect. If you don't believe me, Sarah's back there. She's about nine months pregnant. Ask her, and she'll let you know pretty quick that I'm not perfect. But with that said, though, guys, you still experience that inward change. You know, the, the way you started to think started to change a little bit. See, the thing about it is you don't get right, you don't get right before you get saved. You get right after you get saved. And it, it's a work in progress. And, and the, the thing about it is, is all of a sudden your thoughts start to change, your want to start to change a little bit. And, you know, you, you want to get involved in church. You want to serve. And I, I would strongly, you know, and I don't want to step on any toes here, but I would say that if you are saved and, but you still find yourself, oh, I don't really want to do that, and you need to have some serious self-examination because whenever you're saved, you want to spend more time with God's people because iron sharpens iron every single day of the week, and you get better because of it. Amen. But, you know, that, that's, that's how I got saved. But I do want to sit here. I, I do want to talk just a little bit about, you know, and I hope that every single person sitting in here is, uh, is saved. But I don't, you know, only God, only you and God know that. And, and the thing about it is, is that, I'm standing up here talking about, you know, oh, I got saved, I, you know, I am saved. But there is no judgment, guys. Like, there, there is zero judgment to anybody in here that's not saved. It can happen when you're 20, 25, 85, 105. It don't matter. My, I got saved, you know, I was, I was right around 21, I, I believe. Um, my Uncle Brian, he, he, was, he was in the last two weeks of his life where he got saved. You know, almost, almost, you know, almost missed it. Almost missed it. And, um, and, uh, and the only thing that I can tell you is, is that if you're 80% sure, then I, I, I'm stealing some stuff off of what he said before, but if you're 80% saved, you're 100% going to miss it by 1,000 miles. And here's the thing about it is, is we are in the South, and we are in that good old boys club. And I can tell you that, and I was, I was that way too, I tried to take that approach. And, I, and during my time of conviction, I was sitting there thinking to myself, I was like, I try, I'm a good person. I go to church. I try to do good things for other people. You know, I just, you keep, you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. And at the end of the day, you're missing it by, I mean, miles. But uh, with that said, and I, uh, um, I was supposed to open my Bible before we started. So bear with me here for a second. But um, Roger Miller's favorite verse in the Bible is Romans 5.8. And, and in my opinion... More I really, you know, let this fester and marinate. I think that that is the verse of the Bible that I misconceived my whole life. And it says this. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that he did it anyways. And although he knew that we were wretched and dirty and worthless. And, and that's my thing about it is, as I started trying to play through my head, what, what did I experience that prevented me from getting saved? What is other people potentially experiencing from, from them getting saved? And one of the big things is trying to clean yourself up. I mean, that's just human nature. You, you want to try to be more presentable, and that's, it's pointless, guys. You're going to spend 
your entire life trying to become presentable enough for God when the fact of the matter is you can never be good enough. You can never be good enough. And, 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 the, and the leading on to that, like, I mean, I've, I've seen people in my life where God's got in on them, and, you know, you start seeing the change, and it's, you know, praise God for that. You know, I'm, I'm going to start, you know, I'm, you know draw, I'll start talking a little better, drop a few bad habits, may even click on the Christian radio from time to time. Now, that is, now, to me, that's conviction. That's not, that's not getting your right, life right. That's just, that's trying, to, that's trying to remedy the conviction before getting saved, in my opinion. And, and, that, and that's where I'm getting at on this, is you can, you can do all that. But if you don't have that time, and I think, I got it in here, I think it's Romans 10, 13, paraphrasing, of course, it says, for all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is the one way that you will be saved today is by getting on your face, and you've know, you got to say, God, I cannot live this life alone. You've got to save me. And, and, that, and, that, is, and that, that is it, and that is all. And, and, that's, and, and that's, a, that's a big part of it. You know, it is the only part of it. And then after you experience that, that's whenever you started, like I was talking about, you're going to start wanting to do different things. Sometimes you hang out with different people. Sometimes you just, you just, you know, you might be weird. And that's, and what I'm saying, you know, if for young, old, and different, if you're a little bit worried about it because it might not be the cool thing to do, um, from the best I can tell with what's going on today, weird probably needs to be the new cool. And, and that's, and that's, and that, that's to me like, you know, what are my friends going to think? Well, if they're your friends, they're going to support you through it. And even after that, they're probably going to feed off you a little bit and they're going to learn from it. And then, then it's eventually going to happen to them too. And, what I, and, and one of the things that I wanted, one of the last things that I wanted to say here, guys, is, is that I, I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve the things that I've had happen in my life. Um, God's blessed me more than I could ever even imagine. But if you're, if you're wondering if you're good enough, I wanted to read this really quickly. It says, Abraham was old. Elijah was, uh, was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Job was bankrupt. Moses had a speech impediment. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. If God can use each and every single one of them people for the glorification of his kingdom, then he can use anybody sitting under this roof today. And, and that's, and that's you know, and I, I'm not a preacher, and I don't have one of those big kind of, you know, you know, you know, David does a very good job of summing things up right for that invitation time. I don't have that. But all I can tell you is, is that if you're, if you're not saved today, then the, the longer you wait, you know, you're not promised the next day. You're not promised, you're not promised to leave here and make it to lunch. And, that, and that's kind of what I'm sitting here trying to drill home today is that if there's somebody sitting under this roof right now that has not taken care of business, I'm not sure how many of you have sat here or sorry, I don't know how many of you have been to a cattle auction, but sometimes they'll be auctioning those things off. The bidding will stall just a little bit, and then somebody will take over and just start talking for a second. And they're not trying to get, you know, they're try, not trying to stir up more interest. They're trying to give people more time to think. And that's the only thing I'm trying to do here this morning. I'm trying to give you just a little bit more time. I'm trying to hold the clock just a little bit longer to give you some time to think about if this is a decision and time where you need to take care of business today. So with that said, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the, the honor of being able to get up here and do this. And I hope that there's more people in this church that'll that'll follow the same suit because I think it, it enables us to get on a, a more personal level, you know, and, and not necessarily the form of, of a preacher. No, 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 no offense, you know, just we're just regular people up here today telling telling us what happened, you know, what happened to us. And there's there's just only one thing about it is that that God or Jesus Christ's blood alone did in fact move the wheels of history for us. And and I think that, that that's something that we need to uh, grasp with open, open arms because it's ours for the taking. So thank you all today. If you will remain standing and grab your copy of God's Word. Boy, listen, Nick, uh, two weeks ago and then Daniel this morning, uh, you, you have heard two of the best sermons that's probably ever been spoken in this church. Uh, I mean, uh, the Lord was on that and, and is going to use that and has used that in just a great, great and mighty way. Daniel, thank you so, so much for being so clear. And, uh, and communicating the gospel to us so effectively. My goodness, that's just uh, absolutely amazing. Well, I am going to do this. I know God has spoken to your heart. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I believe there's somebody here who, who you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. 
Uh, so I, I need some of you to have your Bibles to Romans 10, uh, 9 and 13. Not, not everybody, but I'm talking about um, our workers in the altar, people that can come and lead uh, folks to the Lord. You need to be ready for that because I'm anticipating the rain. Amen? Amen. God's dealing with somebody's heart. At least put the scripture on the board, if you will, but I'm going to speak this morning on uh, just a subject here. And really much of it ties in uh, with, uh, with where Daniel has taken, uh, taken us today um, and some of what uh, he said. Uh, I will be uh, backing up uh, with uh, the things God's laid in our heart. And we're in Romans 10 verse 9. Um, and uh, I've had a burden in my heart. So for all of our parents and grandparents, I need you to take note get your notepad out and be ready to write uh, because this burden has been in my heart for a long, long time. I've been in ministry 25 years, standing in the pulpit, probably 26 now, uh, maybe, maybe 27. I'd have to do the math real fast. But, uh, and so I, I've been able to grow in this area myself and as I lead people. Uh, but today I want to speak specifically just for a few minutes this morning on uh, leading our children to the Lord on leading our children to the Lord. Now look in Romans 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, that's very plain right there. There's a lot of this easy believism and slick willy gospel today that just wants you to believe in this Jesus, this, this teddy bear, uh, and he sits on a rainbow and he's playing a harp. Well, he's Lord Jesus, and what makes him Lord is, is he died for our sins, and he rose again in victory on that third day, and he's seated on his throne uh, at the right hand of the Father uh, this morning. So believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou sh uh, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You may be seated. May God add the blessings uh, to the reading uh, of his word. Uh, so... For years and years, I struggled with this myself, how to lead children to the Lord, particularly after my children come along and were born. Uh, and I, as a pastor, uh, I thought uh, that uh, I had fine... I've told you this story before, but I thought I had fine-tuned the way you give the, the Thursday night uh, evang uh, evangelistic service during Bible school. Uh, and so let me say right now that... Uh, I do believe there are Bible school conversions that take place, uh, but I also believe that one of the most careless ways that your average church deals with the souls of our children is during Bible school because that's a pastor's time to get 75 kids inside of a sanctuary and preach uh, Jesus or preach hell or whatever it is and then say, okay, who wants, to, who wants to be saved? And all 73 kids get up and come to the altar and the pastor gets to put it on Facebook bragging about having a huge baptism because you've had 73 people say That's dealing carelessly with the souls of our children. Uh, and so I struggle with this as pastor. How do we do this? And so I had kind of limited the ages as to who could come out on evangelistic night in Bible school. And I uh, had two little boys in the church at the time, and they were the most mean. I'm just going to be on. I can't be kind about it. Uh, this, I just got to be truthful. They were the most mean, corrupt undisciplined children that you have ever been around. If we had to, listen, if we didn't watch those boys, they would have burnt our church plumb to the ground. I mean, they were ram, they were beyond rambunctious. It was, they were criminal at, at that young age. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, they were in the evangelistic service that Thursday night. I felt like I had done a good job in presenting the gospel and I thought I had had it in such a way that where there wouldn't be false converts and that I had dealt very carefully with the souls of our children. And so I had all the kids bow their head and close their eyes. I didn't want everybody doing what the other kid beside them was doing. Uh, and I, I asked them what, however it was I present, presented it, you know, if you would, you know, if you believe that, uh, you know, that Christ died for you, rose again, like to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, you raise your hand. Well, the oldest brother, they were sitting side by side, sitting back in the middle of the church. The oldest brother raised his hand, and, and nobody was looking around. I made sure that nobody was looking around. He raised his hand, but I saw him look up, and he peeped over at his brother with one eye, and his brother was just sitting there with his hands crossed. And I heard him say, I watched him and then heard him say this. He hit his brother and he said, raise your hand, stupid, you're lost too. 
And then I realized I got to redo this and start all over. Lord, this ain't working and I don't know what to do. Uh, but leading our children to the Lord is something very, very critical. And I've seen, I have seen in 25 years and watched I, I, uh, many mistakes that are made when it comes to leading our children to the Lord. In fact, it's very, some of them are very grievous mistakes and it troubles me to the depth of my being. It's the kind of things that I walk around thinking about and I can't shake it. I eat thinking about it and I lay in the bed at night thinking about it. And I know it's a very difficult thing to do and it makes moms and dads very, very nervous. Uh, but uh, let's look at a couple of things very quickly. So when we talk about leading our children to the Lord, number one, I want us to ask this, what is the gospel? So we're very clear on this. What is the gospel? Uh, and I know you've heard this from the pulpit. And Nick did a great job explaining it. Daniel did a wonderful job. But I just want to be very clear on the gospel. The gospel is this, is that we are sinners and we can't save ourselves. Do you hear me? If you come to liberty, you will not hear somebody stand in this pulpit and say, you are a sinner, get your life right. What you're going to hear is, is that we... You and me, we are sinners and we can't save ourselves. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. Uh, but the Bible also says, as Daniel read, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So Jesus came to, sa to seek and save sinners. He died for our sins. He rose again on that third day. He ascended into heaven. And we trust Him and we are saved by repentance and putting our faith in Him and not of our own works. It's all of Him, lest any man should boast. So that is the gospel. But I also want to ask this question. So we need to ask this, the second question. What is repentance? Now this is key when we're talking about our children. Just listen, and I'll come to this in a little while. But what is repentance? Now watch. Repentance is a change of mind. We begin to see sin as God sees sin. That it's not just a mistake. Uh, that it's not just a, a, a personality flaw. It's not just uh, that, uh, that, well, we're just not perfect. But we begin to see sin as God sees sin. And, what, and the way God sees sin is, God sees sin as being so serious that it took Him sending His Son Jesus to die for our sins so we could have a perfect sacrifice, shed His blood, that our sins could be washed away. So, so what is repentance? It's a change of mind that results eventually in a change of heart. So there's a difference between those two. Daniel touched on them. And see, there's a matter of intellect. Much, and I'm going to come to this, but I'll come back to this in a minute. Much of the decisions that we, uh, that, that, that I see when mom and dad are le attempting to lead their children to the Lord, it's nothing more than an intellectual decision by our children because we've rushed some things. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But you do remember the Bible says that even the demons of hell, they believe in the tenets of the gospel. The demons of hell believe that Jesus came, shed his blood, died, and rose again. They believe he was born of a virgin. Listen, they believe it all. But they can never repent and they will never be saved. Uh, and so simple intellectual belief is not enough. Uh, and so repentance, it's a change of mind that results in a change of heart. So it's that heart change where, you're, where you acknowledge by faith that yes, I am a sinner and I need Jesus to save my soul. As a result, it brings a change in will. Our will, that's where we say yes to Jesus. That's where we bow at 825 Bidgeon Street between our bed and vertical blinds and a sliding door. We get on our face and we say, God, forgive me. I am a sinner. Save my soul. Jesus. That's where we bow behind a chicken house. That's when, that's when we uh, bow, right, or by, uh, at least bow our heart while we're driving down the road. That's, why we, that's, that's when we step out and come down that aisle and get in the altar. That's, that's when there's been a change of will when we say yes to Jesus. So repentance is a change of mind, which results in a change of heart, which results in a change of will. And so, as we're thinking about our children specifically, so what age are we speaking of when, when we're talking about that age of accountability? Now, I want to say right now, age of accountability, you won't find that in the Bible. Okay, that, 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 that phrase is not in the Bible. So what are we talking about? We talk about age of accountability. That's an age when children begin to understand the difference between right and wrong. 
Okay, that, that's that age. That varies depending upon the maturity of your particular child. Some children, you know, they are extremely mature at a very, very early age. Other children, they don't mature. I was 25 years old, and I still hadn't matured. So I'm confessing my sins. You can confess your sins whenever you preach one Sunday. Uh, so, but, but that depends on the age of the child's maturity. But you need to be aware of this fundamentally as a child. Psychologists that have studied cognitive development in children, listen, they say that, uh, it, that it's not until around the age of seven or eight that children can start to understand the issues of sin and morality. Uh, it's not till the age of 78 that they can start to understand the issues of the consequences of, of sin and the consequences uh, of morality or immorality. Uh, and, and, so, and they say that between the ages of 8 and 12, that is the prime time when most all children begin to really understand that actions have consequences. And so they can start to understand the gospel. So generally speaking, according to cognitive development in children, it's not till 7 to 8 that that happens. Now, I know the maturity of children... Uh, uh, is, is largely dependent upon uh, that. Uh, I know also know their exposure to the gospel. And that's another reason to come to liberty. You be here on Sunday mornings and you be here on Wednesday nights because what, what's happening is, is you are already, according to Deuteronomy, uh, morning, noon, and night, and as you walk, and as you play, and as you take vacations, and, and as you eat, and all of that stuff, you are already pumping Jesus into the life of your children. What you need now is, is you need to have them here on Sunday morning, you need to have them here on Wednesday nights, and we are going to load them up with Jesus and the Word of God so that when they are ready and have reached that age, they can trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so... So that's, uh, that's that age, generally around seven and eight, but it does depend, too, on their exposure uh, to the gospel. Now, when we take these things into consideration, uh, one of the things we want to look at is, and one of the things I want to uh, uh, just to, to, to kind of share with you what I see and what's happening. So what happens in oftentimes? Our, our child is five or six years old, whatever the age may be. And all of a sudden, they express an interest to be saved. Hey, I want to be saved. You need to know that what kids do is this. So as adults, when we get under conviction, we may or may not talk about it. I didn't mention it to anybody. Man, God started convicting me, and I was miserable. I was trying to fix things on the inside, and I was trying to work on things on the inside. I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. My grandpa tried to mention it just in a very, very roundabout way one time, and I got so mad and so angry because I was trying to work it out. Sometimes adults do talk about it when they get under conviction. Sometimes they'll verbalize it and just hash it out and want to talk to you about it and, and talk to what they're feeling and what's going on. And if they decide to trust Christ, what does this mean for their life? And so sometimes adults do talk about it. But one thing you can be sure about kids is as soon as they think it, 99% of the time they're going to speak it. And so what I see is I see kids speak it for the first time and mom and dad jump right on that and lead them straight to Jesus. But it's the first thoughts a kid is having about the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, we get ahead of ourselves. Fastly and quickly we get ahead of ourselves. So just because a kid mentions it the first time, mother and dad, listen to me, that does not mean they want to be saved, they need to be saved right then, let's make it happen. And so what, what has happened is when a mom or dad does that, when a mom or dad does that, then what we now have is a child who has made an intellectual decision to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And from that point on, for the rest of their days, they'll go back to that point and say, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Where there's never been a heart decision and there's never been a, a change of will in their life. And so... That's what I see oftentimes. And so that, that's what's happening. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Okay, so, so what do we do uh, in a, based on that? Well, so, so how do we lead our children to the Lord? So number one, listen to me. Number one, prayer 
is so essential. Okay, when does that praying start? The first time that kid mentions wanting to be saved? No. No, that praying starts, mom and dad, when you conceive that child in your womb. That's when that praying starts. And dad, every single day you need to be praying over that child that's in that womb, asking God to keep that child, to protect that child, to give that child strength, health, and all of those things, and then ask God, God, one day this child will be of an age where they need to be saved, and Lord, let us so give them Jesus in our life and in our home, and let us be such part of a church where they'll hear Jesus that when they reach that age where they understand fully uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, save their souls, Jesus. And grandparents, for those of you who have booted your kids out of the home and your empty ministers, and you got grandchildren coming along or grandchildren being born, let me tell you, your job is not over. That's when you start praying, and that's when you start asking God to touch that child in the womb of your child, that one day they too may be saved by the grace of God. I realized the importance of that. I've I recently found out that I'm going to be a grandpa. So I know, I know at 35, I, you know, <laughs> way too young to be a grandfather, but hey, you know, we'll roll with that. But so the Lord has shown me this is where your prayer focus needs to be. Yes, for the health of my daughter. Yes, for the health of that baby. But for the salvation of that child when they, when they reach that age. So number one, it starts with prayer. That's, that is huge. That's huge in this thing. Uh, number two, you've got to talk about Jesus as has as been, as, as been commanded in Deuteronomy. You've got to be real in your own life. You've got to be the real deal. You can't be pretend and fake. You can't just show up and check a box on as a Sunday morning believer. But man, I mean, Jesus has got to be the theme of conversation in your home. You say, preacher, that's just a little fanatical that we're going to talk about Jesus all the time. Well, you're so far from fanatical, you won't get there in a week's time. I say, let's edge on up to that line. He is our everything, and if He is such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so pure, then we ought to be speaking of Him. But we're going to talk about Jesus at breakfast, at lunch, at supper. We're going to pray. We're going to expose them to the gospel as much as we can expose them uh, to the gospel. We're going to get them in church. We're going to get them under sound biblical teaching, under sound biblical preaching, and let them see the power of God uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray for them. We're going to expose them to the gospel. And mom and dad, let me say something right here. There's something that's missing in the life of our children in society today. I hope it's not in the life of your child. And, 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 and believers, it's, it's, it is as much in the church as it is outside the church. And we have missed this point right here. In the life of our child as a parent, and this is all in the Word of God, in the life of our child as a parent, we need to give them responsibility and we need to be giving them accountability. And I'm going to tell you why. Let me explain that first. Responsibility. I counseled a couple who was having marital problems. They had a 17-year-old daughter at home. The wife starts telling me her side of the troubles and the problems in this marriage. And she is so overburdened with work. And then she gets home from work, she's overburdened with work at home. The husband's not helping out, she says. And she said, on top of that, I go into my daughter's room and it's piled knee high in all of the corners, mess and junk, and I have to spend half the night cleaning up her daughter's I said, stop right there, wait a minute. Stop right there. Your daughter's how old? 17. I said, when did she break her legs? She ain't broke her legs. Oh, when did she break her arms? She ain't broke her arms. I said, let me tell you something. At 17 years old, you better get that stress off of you and you march her in that bedroom and you let her clean that joker up and you let her put her stuff up. 17 years old. We're not teaching our children responsibility. Now, stay with me. This is not, I'm not going off on a tangent. Be with me. I love you, but I'm about to tie it together right here. We're not teaching them responsibility. My mom said that when I was a child, two, three, whatever years old, you know, some 35 years ago, that uh, that's just for those of you who are listening or not listening. That was a test. When I would get my toys out to play, she would make me, when I finished, she'd make me pick my toys up and go put them back in the toy box or wherever they went to. Teaching responsibility. Did the same thing with my kids. Teaching them responsibility. 
I remember along the, along the age of like five years old, Elizabeth, she wanted to help wash dishes. We didn't have a dishwasher. Uh, we, we just had this. And she wanted, to learn, she wanted to help wash dishes. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And Sarah was like, she's not going to do them good. We're going to have to redo them. I said, that's okay, we'll redo them. But we're going to give her some responsibility and let her know how to do this. Make their beds. Put their clothes up after they've been washed and folded. Things like that. We give them responsibilities. But then we teach them accountability. That listen, we've got this thing so screwed up. The, the Bible says uh, that uh, children obey your parents for this is right in the sight of the Lord. Children obey your parents. Because you know what? We, we as parents, we want to obey our children. If our children don't want to do something, then we just let them do it. If they don't want to pick up, we just let them do it. If they want to pitch tantrums, we just let them do it. Because if we step in, it's going to interfere with their development as a person. And we don't want to harm them and send them on a course you know, of self-destruction or what. Listen to me. That's Bible. And we teach kids uh, accountability. We teach kids responsibility. That when you do right, you're rewarded. And when you do wrong, they ought to be some kind of consequence. Now, what's that got to do with anything? Let me tell you what that has to do with anything. That's teaching them from day one that they are responsible before God for their life and for their sins. It's teaching them from day one that there are consequences to their actions. If you've got a... Listen... If you have a five-year-old that you have not shown them there's consequences for their actions and you stuck to your guns on that, when they are 15, they will be a threat to you and your very existence because they will be a 15-year-old with no ideal or concept of consequences to their actions in their life. But what that does is it shows them that they are accountable to a holy God, that they have to answer to a holy God and it will bring them to the gospel of Jesus one day when they reach that age. Are you with me? Say amen. 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 Now, so little Johnny comes and he says, I want to be saved because they see somebody saved in church. They hear you talking about somebody being saved. They hear you talking about the gospel and the need of, and the need of salvation in their life. And so they say, I want to be saved. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And you have that conversation with them. Now, mom and dad, listen, the air... The error is this. It's saying, oh, they want to be saved. And so you, you share the gospel with Johnny, and of course, Johnny can regurgitate it. He can regurgitate it. But mom and dad, listen. This is number four, whatever the number is, three, four, whatever. You need to ask open-ended questions to your child. Not, do you want to be saved? Do you believe Jesus died? Do you believe Jesus rose again? Do you want to ask him into your heart? Not these yes or no questions. Open-ended questions. Well, who is God? And, and who is Jesus? Well, he, he died for my sins. What does that mean? They ought to be able to articulate that and explain that. They don't have to be a theologian. They don't have to be a preacher at whatever age it may be, but they need to be able to articulate the gospel from their own lips, not, not just regurgitate what you give them and five minutes later be outside shooting the BB gun running up and down the road. Now, there's not going to be a huge fundamental change in the life of a child, generally speaking. Not like, a, not like if you had a 49-year-old who was out hitting the bars and chasing women and all that. They won't be a big dramatic testimony there. But nevertheless, I believe any testimony is dramatic when God saves a sinner from a devil's hell. Uh, and so, uh, but... Uh, but they need to be able to do more than just regurgitate what you just put in them. Now, let me say this, too. When a child starts talking about it, and, I, and I'm okay to critique on this, I kind of know where I stand. I'm confident in this. What we have done in leading our children to the Lord in this, this erroneous kind of way where little Johnny speaks it, and so we're just like, oh, you want to be saved, Johnny? Well, you know Jesus died for you. You know he rose again. You want, you, you want to go to heaven? Well, you want to pray right now, little Johnny? We lead Johnny to the Lord. Well, we've, what we've done is we've produced an intellectual convert which has for the rest of their days possibly give them a place where they go back to and say, oh, I remember praying that prayer when I was a kid, so I'm okay. When they're really not okay at all. What we've done, though, is we have removed the Spirit of God from conversion and from the salvation experience. You hear what I'm telling you? Jesus said this, no man comes to... To the Father. No, no man comes to me unless the Father draws him. There's got to be the Spirit of God involved in salvation. You heard Nick, you heard Daniel just then, and both of them were talking about conviction and the Spirit of God drawing them. 
And so when a kid first starts talking about it, yes, let's teach them the gospel. But I wouldn't bring it to a conclusion at that point in time. Not that first time. Now listen, at this point, because we're acknowledging the gospel, we're acknowledging repentance, we're acknowledging the need of God's Spirit to work, Just like God's working in somebody's heart right now from hearing this. And you're not thinking about a child. You're thinking about yourself because Daniel used the word of God in his testimony to awaken your conscience. So listen, God knows that we are trying our best here to because because we love our kids. And I want to remind you, God loves your children far more than you ever could love your children. He knows we're, we're doing beyond our best here that we don't want to produce an intellectual convert and only an intellectual convert, which only an intellect, only knowing Christ intellectually will not get you to heaven. In fact, if you die only knowing him intellectually and that's it, you will spend an eternity in a place called hell. Okay, so God knows our heart that we want the spirit to involve, to be involved in this and the spirit drawing our child. So what do we do with that? How do we handle it? Here's what we do. We teach our child the gospel. And then we shut up about it and leave it with them. Let's see if they're going to come back and talk about it. Because I'm going to tell you something. If the Spirit's dealing with them, they'll come back and talk about it again. And we'll have that conversation again. We'll share the gospel with them. And we'll let it end right there. See if they have any questions. And we'll try to walk away from it. Because I'll tell you this. When God is convicting a child, they will not leave you alone about it. I'm not saying to push our children away. See, there's a balance here. We don't want to jerk our child into it and produce an intellectual convert. But we we also don't want to push them so hard that they can never be saved. But all all we're doing is is we're giving the Spirit time to work now. See, little Johnny started talking about, hey, I want to be saved. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Here's what it means. And just leave it at that. You don't, don't have to bring them to a decision right then and there. Well, what if something happens, preacher? What if we put it off? Listen. God loves your child too much to send the child to hell because we may have done not exactly the most perfect thing. But I will tell you this, if we snatch our children and drag them into it and produce an intellectual convert, then that'll be on our hands too. But give God's Spirit time to work in the life of that child. They're going to ask about it, probably verbalize it. Talk to them about what the gospel means. Explain to them then, listen. Explain to them that, listen, little Johnny, there's going to be a time, and you're going to know when that time is. And you're going to know that that's your time when you need to ask Christ into your heart and confess Jesus as Lord. You'll know when that time is. And so until then, you pray, and we're going to pray for you as a mom and dad. And then when that time comes, you listen to God and you obey. You explain it in childlike terms. That they need to know there's going to be a time. And listen, Jesse, you can come or me, you come, which, whatever way you want to do the invitation, whatever you have in your heart, and you can go ahead and begin playing. But listen, this is, this is a burden in my heart a burden in my soul because we have so many children at Liberty. We've got so many children, and I know that it's a tough place to be. It's a tough situation to be in. It's hard as a parent. I understand that. I've tried to be very plain and very clear. Go back and listen to this message again on Facebook Live. And grandparents, you listen to it because grandparents, you may be the one that lead them to the Lord. And grandparents, they may be a mom, but grandparents, your child may come to you and say, listen, you're... Your, grand, your grandchild is asking about being saved. What do I do? And you're going to, you need an answer. You need an answer. But as soon as little Johnny mentions it, don't jerk them into salvation. Oh, they, they need to be saved now because we're just producing emotional, uh, uh, mental or intellectual converts. And we've left the Spirit of God out in dealing with the sinner. Remember, remember this. God sent His Spirit. To convict to us, to convince us is that word literally of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. And listen, we've had the girls around the gospel since they were born and even before they were born, obviously. And, and we, I've done everything that I've told you that, we, that you need to do. And, and one of the most heart-wrenching things for me, and man, I, I'm telling you, I wanted to jump out of bed and grab the gospel fire hose. 
is the girls were around preaching, they were around teaching. And I mean, Jesus was the emphasis in our house. And I think maybe we'd come back from a, a revival one night, and Elizabeth had been talking about it a little bit along the way. And so we have, the, we have that conversation about being saved. We, don't bring, we didn't bring her to a decision just because she talked about it. Oh, you want to be saved? Well, let's talk about it. Come on. Come to Jesus. Pray this prayer. No, we, we just had a conversation about the gospel. But we come back from a meeting one night, a revival meeting, and she laid down in her bed and we laid down in ours. And she hollered for me. She said, Daddy. I said, yeah, baby. And she said this. She said, if I die tonight... She said, well, I go to hell. Boy, listen. I wanted to grab the gospel fire hose and run in there and make her repeat this prayer because she could regurgitate the gospel. She could regurgitate it. But had she got to an age yet where she could cognitively understand the consequences of sin and uh, immorality? And had she got to a place in her maturity to where uh, she, she could, whether she understood the word repentance or could say the word repentance or not. And she got to a place where there was a change not only in mind, because see, that's what was going on in her at the time. And you've got to be able to identify this mom and dad. You've got to understand when there's a change going on in their mind. But she, she got to a place where in her maturity level where she had a change of mind and she was having a change of heart which was leading to a change of will in her life. Well, I knew that night she wasn't there yet, but it was taking place. There was changes going on. But I left it with the Lord. I didn't run in there and pull her into it. I left it with the Lord because I wanted the Spirit of God to draw her. Not me, not Daddy. I didn't want to draw her to the gospel, but I wanted God's Spirit to draw her to the gospel. Listen, I want to tell you something. God's faithful. God's faithful when it comes to saving your children, when it comes to saving you. But again, He loves your children more than you ever could love your children. And so, two things here. Number one, what if I have made that mistake, preacher? How do I get out of this? Because my child started talking about it, and I just immediately jumped on it and said, Oh, you want to be saved? Well, here's what the gospel means. Do you know Jesus died for you and rose again? He died for your sins? And, and, and little Johnny recited it to me, preacher. He regurgitated it to me. And I, and I jumped on it and I moved too fast. And I didn't give God's Spirit time to work. And I was the agent of salvation rather than the Holy Spirit being the agent of salvation in the life of my child. What do I do? I've made that mistake. Well, i tell you what you do. You leave that child in the hands of the Lord from this day forward. You keep praying for their salvation if you think you've made that mistake. You ask God to convict them and you ask God to draw them and you ask God to use you and your home to do that and this church to do this, do that. And you ask God to make it undeniable in their life when that conviction comes and when they step, they step out and make that step of faith. And God will be faithful to do that and hear those prayers because you're praying God's perfect will. But the last thing we want to do, if you've not got to that place yet, is produce an intellectual convert because that child will grow up and they'll think, yeah, on that day I said that prayer and I'm good when they're really not good at all. You heard Daniel's Bible school testimony just then. And so mom and dad and grandparents, listen, God has shown me my job's not over. My job's not over. I've got two children serving the Lord. My job's not over because I've got grandchildren coming. And so grandparents and parents, I think what I would do today is, because eternity is before us, is I would bring my child to the Lord. And, and you say, well, I've already done that. I'd do it again. I would do it again. I would do it every single day. Every single day. Job got up and made sacrifices for his children because it may have been that they sinned. Not that they did. Not that they really screwed it up. Not that they were boneheads. But the Bible says that it may have been that they sinned, so Job took them to the Lord every day. You need to bring your children to the Lord and say, Lord, they're yours. And I just acknowledge it. And in salvation, they're yours. And give me wisdom when it comes to that time. Give me wisdom when they start asking that question. But listen to me. I want to say this right here. 
And so you folks that can lead people to the Lord, you be ready. But there's somebody here who when Daniel spoke, it resonated in your heart. I mean, when Daniel spoke, the Spirit of God took his word from Daniel's lips and lodged it in your heart. And you know that you yourself don't have no testimony because you yourself are a Bible school convert or somebody dealt carelessly with your soul along the way. I heard a preacher tell this morning about sitting over on that side of the church and he said an evangelist had come and preached a revival. And he said the evangelist g- gave uh, an invitation. He turned it over to the pastor and he said the pastor then gave a multi-avenue uh, uh, multi, uh, invitation. And one of the things the pastor said was if anybody in this church means anything to you, I want you to go to them uh, and let them know how much you love them in the Lord. And that, that, little, that, that preacher said, as a 10-year-old boy, he said he sat over there and looked around. Nobody was moving. And he said, well, I didn't want the preacher to feel bad. And he said, I appreciated the preacher, and I loved the preacher. So he said, I come over. Uh, and he said, uh, he said I, the preacher took me by the hand. He said, music was playing, and the preacher was an older preacher. He said, preacher, I just want you to know I love you and I appreciate you. And he said, the preacher's a little hard of hearing, and the music was loud. And he said, the preacher leaned down and said, son, what'd you say? And he said, I just want you to know I love you and appreciate you. He said, the preacher stood there for just a minute, kind of got a strange look on his face. And he said, oh, you want to be saved? And he said, as a 10-year-old boy, I didn't know what to do, so I froze and just went. (laughs) And he said, next thing I know, I'm sitting on a pew filling out a little card, checking some boxes, saying I give my life to the Lord. Listen to me. The Spirit's drawing you. It's no accident you're here today. Whether you've been a member at Liberty for 35 years or 85 years, or this is your first time, the gospel has been communicated so clearly. So moms and dads, as you come and you bring your children, and as you weep before the Lord for the souls of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, And I'm going to ask you that if you need to be saved today and you want to give your life to Jesus, that you step up and you come toward this altar. Find me and look me in the eyes and we're going to take the Bible, the Word of God, and we're going to point you to Jesus. So if you will stand and come to this altar this morning.